we had the whole what is it where is he jackson hole wherever the hell that is i don't even know where that is no right yeah. it sounds like a terrible place to be by the way <laughs> and it, yeah it's like grenaded everything and i think my my stocks this week have felt what like did he say 10%. i didn't see that what did he actually say he basically came out and said we're gonna look at inflation number but expect more pain he said pain yeah, yeah he literally said pain <laughs> Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of the Tom Story Show. Just before we get this episode started, I want to thank everybody so far who's been either watching this on YouTube or listening on the audio platforms. Steve told me last week that somehow this little show with us fools was number 53, I think, Steve, 50 feet three on business podcast for Apple in Canada, and in Canada. <laughs> Let's make that clear in Canada. <laughs> Um, so we're really proud of that because we know actually a lot of the viewership does come from YouTube. So to find out that it's doing that well, just on the audio side, we really appreciate you guys listening and we re really hope that you're enjoying it so far. Now, this takes me to my next point. And thank you so much to everyone that has rated us on Apple Podcasts. If you are enjoying these episodes, if you have two seconds, you can take out your day, go to Apple Podcasts. We've kind of figured out that's the main platform that spreads the uh, reviews to everywhere else. If you're liking us, uh, you can give us a five-star review. And if you don't like us, just don't go to Apple Podcasts and review us. You can just go on with your day. Um, I also want to say that this episode is sponsored by a company that's very important to Steve and myself. Uh, it's sponsored by Masters Academy coming up in Toronto on November the 14th and 15th. And Masters Academy is run by Richard Robbins International. So I've been coaching uh, personally with them for the last eight years. I think, Steve, you're at what, year 12 or 13? At least 12 years in. Yeah, both very, very slow learners, as Rich will like to tell us. Um, a lot of people have already listened to the episode that we did with Richard. If you haven't, after you listen to this episode, make sure to go back and check that one out. So Masters Academy um, is essentially where all the top producers in Canada in the real estate industry go to learn. And the greatest thing about this one coming up now, this is in Toronto. It's November the 14th and 15th in person you're going to get to go into a room with over a thousand people that take their business seriously. Um, these events, frankly, for me, have changed my life. Everything that I do in my real estate business, I've learned in some capacity from this coaching organization. And what we have special for our listeners of this podcast, there will be a link in the show notes or anywhere below in the description that you can go and we, you're going to get $200 off tickets. Um, I can guarantee you if you go and pay the price for what these tickets are going to get, you're going to get 10 times that back in ideas that you can implement into your business right now. What you can expect from Masters Academy this year, it's going to be in person. Both Steve and myself are going to be there. I heard Steve is doing a forehead signatures. If you want his autograph, he'll do it right on the forehead for you. And uh, here's what you can expect. The five-step system to building a business and life that you love. Because as we know, there's a lot of real estate agents that make a lot of money, but they have no life. So how do you find that balance in the middle? The generating a 20% return on your database. The lifetime referral system is what I run my business. It's the lifeblood of my, system, of my business. If I can only choose one thing in my business, this would be what I would choose. How to increase your marketing impact and ROI, doubling down on lead gen that works for you and getting off that real estate treadmill, trying to figure out what path you're going to take next. If you're finding a little bit of burnout or you're just getting to a point in your business where you're not sure what's next. And the final thing is story selling. So how can you put out the type of marketing with stories that's actually going to stick? Because you don't just want to be that real estate agent that's putting out just sold and, hey, it's always a good time to buy and always a good time to sell because that's not very helpful. So for anyone listening to this podcast, Masters Academy is happening in Toronto on November the 14th and 15th. And 15th, it is in person. It is live. Richard is running it. They have some amazing guest speakers for that day. Steve and myself will be there. And if you want to get a ticket, it is $200 off in the link in the description. Steve, anything to add to that? You bet. I love this. Uh, I mean, I've been going to it forever and ever. I think everybody that is an agent that's in Toronto, I mean, I'm flying into Toronto. Uh, well, I'm not sure, Tom, why we have a sponsor that I'm paying to go see, but we'll figure that out for sure. Um, but I pay to go there. I know you pay to go there. We're both involved in coaching. Uh, I love the two day format that includes things like, like small giants, little ideas that you can really take action on in your business. 
uh, the lightning round, the, the genius interviews. So what they do is they actually take somebody who's a hot, high top producer, like our guest today, and uh, puts them on the panel. I don't know if he's going to be there, though. Maybe we should try and sell him a ticket right now. Uh, 200 bucks off if you use the link down below in the description, November 14th and 15th. And now our very, very, very special guest is Zen from Prime Properties TO. Now, Zen is the broker of record at Remax Excel Advantage Realty. He also runs a YouTube channel that pumps out a ton of content and at the moment is, is way uh, more successful on YouTube than both Steve and myself in terms of viewership and subscribers. So we are honored to have him here. Zen, what's going on? Not much. I'm honored to be here. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time attendee. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we we met initially just because we put out videos, right? Like I think, I think you know what it was actually the first time I connected with you was we both had a similar condo. We we weren't saying yeah. necessarily nice things about, and I gave you a heads yeah, up that yeah. you might get a nasty letter from them. Did that ever end up happening? Yeah, we got one afterwards, and then we essentially just got them. Hey, why don't you come by? We'll show you around. Things have changed. I'm like, I'm sure they have, but it's still just something I don't want to go through. Um, I actually had another person that did some YouTube and they had the exact same thing too. So I feel strange that enough, we put out enough content out there, but certain people are watching it. They're like, we make big enough of an impact. It looks like that someone has to come after us with lawyers. And I mean, it's kind of interestingly good, but also the weird thing where like, we got to watch what we say sometimes. Yeah. I learned that the hard way. Um, Steve has gotten off pretty well so far. I don't think he's gotten in trouble from his views online. Is that true, Steve? Uh, I know the video you're talking about, Tom. I don't know if you're okay with me saying this, but don't screw, don't say screw the, you. Don't screw say you. The I'm going to say it anyway. Yeah. I'm, I don't even know okay. the building. I'm it's not okay. You can market. bleep it out in post. You can bleep I, it out in post. No, no, we I'm don't not, edit anything. <laughs> I'm not in your market. So basically, let's give the background here. You did, probably my, my prompting, uh, you did a video pointing out what you thought some not good uh, buildings were in Toronto. Sure. It sounds like, Zen, you've done the same thing and to me that's like any that's information i'm giving my clients right like yeah. don't buy in that building and so what and and that video tom if i'm not mistaken quickly took off to the number one video on your channel within days it was at twenty five thousand views when i uh <laughs> made it when i made it private yeah because you were giving people information that they really wanted and then obviously uh the building was so bad and it was getting such a rap or one of the buildings that you mentioned was getting such a bad rap that they got legal involved. And it sounds like they came after all of you. You inspired me actually to uh, do a very similar video for my channel. And uh, it did what well. it's titled the worst building or worst condo building in Surrey, BC. And do you um, have clients in that building? Have you ever sold in that building? I actually did the video because I was doing a listing sale in that building at that time. I said it's your <laughs> seller. <laughs> Uh, you know what? The seller actually said uh, that I met them from YouTube. Oh. And they sent me a message after saying that was a pretty good video. So spoiler alert. I won't spoiler alert it. Go back and watch it on my uh, on my channel. It's uh, it's an interesting watch. Zen, have you ever had <laughs> other things pop up with clients? Not so much like building management or anything that they've said like, you said this in one of your videos. Why is this not happening type of thing? Uh, not so much because most people I, at least that i meet afterwards they realize like i'm coming from a point of this is what i see these are my inputs and this is what i think is happening but obviously in like if you guys ever go through your comment section there's tons of trolls right and there's a bunch of people who are like you said this you know and this is what's happening look at this idiot realtor and got tons of those <laughs> i uh me and Steve are going to do another whole episode on this topic, but I'll bring it up quickly here at the beginning right. because I, I th I've had a pretty um, good experience on YouTube. Um, oh yeah, you know the trolls are there, but overall it's been like decent feedback. It's created a lot of opportunities in my business, and and I enjoy it. Like honestly, it was an outlet I always would have done for free anyways, and all the bonuses that have come from it are like exciting, right? Um, and because of that, I do a lot of the media as well. And uh, I like both your thoughts on this because I know where Steve stands. It'll be interesting to see what you say, Zen. So I did three media um, things that day. So on the third one, I was like, okay, I got to say something different because I've, I've already talked to two other news stations. And, and the, it was about that millennial report that Royal Page put out because I was reported. Right. I, or I was quoted in that report. I know you did a video on that as well also. Um, I was quoted in that. So I, I did all the media. Anyways. 
they were saying like, why do you think millennials are so interested in buying real estate? And what I said, or what I thought I said was, well, they look at their parents who have owned homes for 30 years that they bought the home to have a roof over their head. And some of their parents became wealthy by mistake by owning real estate. And the point I was trying to make was no one thought their home was going to five times, 10 times in value when they bought it in 1982. They bought it because they wanted somewhere to live. And then one of these the platforms took that clip and, and genius marketing, whoever's on the inside there, like thumbs up. They made the headline of the video and it was a four minute video and that was a, a second of it. They made the headline, Realtor says Canadian homeowners have become wealthy by mistake. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> 60,000 views and 60,000 views like a few days ago. I don't look at the comments anymore because I was like, okay, I got beat up enough here, but it was bad. Oh, that is bad. You are gonna have so many people who think they kind of are geniuses come after you now. I, and I just like, I don't, I actually, I agree with what I said. I don't take back what I said. It was just the context of why I was saying it. And I, and I could have wrapped it up nicer but when you're on live news you kind of just say what comes to your mind right um it's but- crazy to say that because i had a client who worked at cbc mm-hmm. and he was like hey zen you want to come do this uh t- talk with me right and he was interviewing a couple of people for i think uh short-term rental properties and i was like yeah sure i'll help you guys out and it was like a 10 minute interview and the content i saw at the end was nothing like what i actually imply and i was like Oh my goodness. If any of my clients see this, they're going to roast me. So after that, I was like, I think everything that we say gets spliced up and taken out of context because we don't have the ability to control what actually gets sent out there, which is why I like YouTube because it's just me unfiltered. Totally. Yeah. I, I learned my lesson there. And like, honestly, I've probably done live TV 50 times. If one out of every 50, someone doesn't agree with, I'm willing to take those odds. But uh, I just wanted to share that because we're talking about YouTube comments and like, oh, man, if if I'm ever having a good day and I want to feel bad about myself, I'll just go back to that video and look at the comments. Yeah, yeah. you you just got to have thick enough skin to kind of just ignore it. And I just kind of like try to troll other people back. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) That's something in the episode where we had Daniel Fosha on, I was asking him about Twitter and he was like, I just killed him with kindness. Like he's just, he's like, he's never rude back. He always just says something nice, even if it's like the biggest troll comment ever. So how do you deal with that on your channel? Are you doing same things or you're like Steve, where you kind of give them a little jab back and go back and forth? <laughs> oh, no, I generally like troll them back. I right? ask them more of like a rhetorical question that hopefully they don't answer back or at least gives them an idea to have some critical thinking on the other side, right? Because I think um, last time I did an interview, I was with TK and Daryl. And one of the things I was trying to get across is like, everyone just reads these headlines, like, and we're all guilty of it too. Like, you know, us as YouTube realtors, the better the headline, the more views you get. And in conjunction, you'll get more uh, conversions, right? Because that's how business works. So we always have to have some kind of like, for lack of a word, clickbaity thing. And then you always have a lot of people who are kind of trolls. So I was trying to give the impression, guys, look, whatever you're doing, have some critical thinking and understand where this perspective is. And I really think that's what's missing in like this world of like doom scrolling and just reading headlines. One of the things I've been telling Steve about all the time, it's like someone that watches your video, enjoys it and moves on with their day, doesn't comment anything. So I I really think the ones that comment are a very small portion of the viewership, but they're just the loudest. That's it. Yeah, for sure. Have you guys ever been recognized like in person? Like Tom, you (laughs) might, because like you're on TV. I, uh, I, Tom yeah, has Steve, the best first. story for this. You just uh, did, are, did you prep him and pay? Him I did not this? prep him to. Ask no, is, him is, is is this an actual thing? You guys have prepped? We got we to get back like to real estate here in a ago. bit. We got to yeah. get back to real estate here in a bit. But Tom okay, is okay. so secretly, he's so happy. He's just like, I can't believe this happened to me. And and not like he's uh, stuck on himself, but it's just, it, it was hilarious. So I'll let him tell the story. Well, yeah, and, and I'm sure the person, because uh, it sounds like they consume a lot of my content, will be listening to this. So shout out if it was you, it made my day. So I, I've been recognized by other by people in the industry. That happens a lot. Um, but then, you know, I've had like a few people at Starbucks stop me and be like, hey, I like your videos, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, the other day I was in a downtown Toronto condo for a listing presentation. And I was in the lobby and there's this really nice couple and they stopped me and, they, and he asked if he could take a photo with me and asked if I was Tom. And I was like, yeah. And then we had a great conversation. We got a cool photo. That's never happened to me. That was like really like, oh my gosh, 
what we're doing, although all of us combined still have such a small amount of to- like grand scheme things, right? Small amount of viewership. It matters to people. Yeah. And, and people are watching us and, and they and they get to know us. And so, yeah, that just happened where they wanted to take a selfie. And it was like the coolest thing ever. And we had a great conversation. That was the first time that it to that level has happened to me. But that was like kind of kind of actually put it in perspective for me. I was like, you know, we kind of make these videos because we get into the rhythm and we know the games to get the views. And then we we do it for business. So we're going to dig into that as well in this podcast. But yeah. yeah, that that happened like two days ago. So it's funny you asked. Well then, let me before we dig into that. Let me share kind of my most yeah. wacky story. So uh, I'm not really good in person, and sometimes get startled, right? So when I was uh, getting taken off, I think I was at um, like a home show, like years, years back, and someone tapped in the back of my shoulder, and they're like, "Hey, you're that guy on YouTube, right?" And I had no idea how to react because it was the first time I ever was approached, right? This was like years ago. And then I was just like, oh, yeah, I am. And then I just turned around and walked away. <laughs> I had no idea how to act, right? And I was with my wife and she looks over. She's like, what is wrong with you, right? And I was just like, uh, 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 it's too late now. We just like moved on. Yeah, keep walking, honey. Keep walking. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny because like years later, right? Um, someone called me. They're like, uh, oh, yeah, they're trying to sell something. They're like, yo, I, I actually met you before. I'm like, really? I don't recognize your name. And she's like, yeah, uh, we were at that home show. I was like, oh my God, that's you. And I like apologized profusely because I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I just didn't know how to act. <laughs> that's crazy. All right. See, All what right. normally happens with Steve though is people come up and they go, are you Steve from YouTube? And then they they say, you suck. And then they run. <laughs> okay, we're going to... Uh, uh, <laughs> nobody wants to hear us talking about ourselves. Let's, keep, let's move on. I want to know, um, because we got a big week coming up here, right? Yeah. Uh, our show comes out Sunday mornings. Okay. Wednesday is the day. Great hike, Great hike, Great hike day. day. Zen, w- what's going to happen? What's the result? What's Get out your crystal ball. My crystal ball says we're going to get 75 bips. I've been saying that for a little bit. Yeah. And is this and the, it? Is this the final rate hike? Honestly, like everyone's been asking me because like, I study some macro. And I honestly don't even have an idea right now because... Uh, Canada just follows U.S. Like our population and economy is the size of California, right? So if U.S. Uh, kind of lights the inflation roll on fire, I would not be surprised if we follow through, right? Like we're basically just, um, there's a saying, like we're the tail of the dog. Whenever the dog decides a decision, we just follow. So there's no way no one can actually know, right? And all these economists come out saying, hey, look, this is the last one, or hey, they got more to go. Like no one really knows because if the mandate from the central banks is to have maximum employment or and reduce uh, inflation, the two are going to come uh, clashing with one another because when you have high inflation, wages are higher. But when the inflation is too high and people can't get paid, then you're going to lose a lot of jobs, right? So they're going to have that clash at some point and no one knows when that's going to happen. It's funny that you say that. I mean, I agree. We're going to do whatever the Fed does. Yeah. The only interesting thing right now that I'm seeing is our announcements are ahead of the feds. Yeah. So it's almost like if they were smart enough in the States to look at us and go, look, look what's going to happen to us next, because there's a very good likelihood that Jerome Powell just told Tiff what to do. Oh, a hundred percent. I agree. They're all in cahoots, right? There's no way all the world's central banks are dropping rates on the pandemic. They're all in talks. They're all they have, hanging uh, out together at Jackson Hole. Jet? Do you have a group chat? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. A WhatsApp group chat. <laughs> and they make no, it's got to be a signal. They, they got to have their stuff to, deleted <laughs> or telegram, <laughs> telegram. <laughs> they just send uh, terrible memes back and forth to each other. That's probably what they do. Yeah, <laughs> honestly. So, okay. 75, 75 bips. Then what does the next 30 to 90 days look like in your market? This is what my approach has been. Um, I'm taking always data that I see, the activity, and just kind of the conversations I have, boots on the ground. And I'm sure like any agent who does enough volume can probably attest to it. We have picked up an activity. I'm getting more people calling me about buying their and using home more than so than ever. The investors are out, but I'm not getting that many people who are panic selling except for the pre-con people who are trying to assign their contracts and can't close. That's what I'm seeing right now. So 
my gut feeling tells me, as usual, we're going to get a spurt of listings after Labor Day long weekend. And the question becomes, how many buyers are going to be out there? And I would say like 60% of me thinks that we're going to have more buyers than we have sellers. But then the other 40% of me says that there's going to be so many people who couldn't get their price in spring that they're holding up for fall. And depending on how big this rate hike is, it may pull some buyers back and it may be like 50-50 buyer seller and we're just like a stabilizing market. But either way, we're going to have more sales. Prices are going to be up for September and October. And how we head into 2023, nobody knows because it's just going to be dictated by the October rate hike if we have one. That's kind of my short-term three to four month like crystal ball per se. And, and are you telling, what are you telling the, the end user that wants to buy the home? Are you saying to them like, listen guys, how long are you going to own this for? Who cares about a, ch a change in the rates here? You're going to own this house. You could try to time it, but we don't know. Are those the conversations you're having with the buyers? Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's kind of exactly how you phrase it. I'm always like, look, your monthly payment is what you're effectively buying, right? Mm. And if you're net net the same thing, you're not competing with other people, your down payment is lower. It makes sense. But as a person who is kind of obviously selling real estate to you, I don't want to sound like I'm pushing you to buy something. If you wait, that's perfectly fine. Just understand that if you are that type of person who's restricted to a price point and you can't renovate, all the prettiest turnkey picturesque con uh, condos and houses all come out in the fall and they're going to get snatched up, right? Like your, if you have one in four home sell, that one, that's the best, there will be multiple offers on it. But if you're the type of person who's looking for like a grandma's house that still has wallpaper in the basement and paneling, yeah, why don't you wait a little bit and you can find some stuff that's been sitting on the market, right? So it really just depends on who the buyer is and what they're trying to do. I had, um, I put out a comparison chart on Instagram yesterday and it was probably like my most active post in months, like in months. It had like 450 likes. It had 370 shares, which is insane. Wow. And I think like over a hundred states and all, all it was showing was like February versus now, February, a million bucks, now 800,000, February rate 2.5, now 4.5. And it was showing how the payments monthly were basically the same, but in Toronto, you were saving massively on the land transfer tax at a lower purchase price. And your down payment was significantly less if you're going to do 20%. So it's like you were technically it is still better now, but affordability on a monthly basis hasn't yet changed. Not so yet. it's like all the people waiting or commenting saying market's going to crash, blah, blah, blah. It's like at this point, prices have come down almost perfectly to level how much interest rates have gone up in terms yeah. of a monthly payment. Yeah. Um, and, and what I'm hoping is for those first time home buyers that are on the cusp of getting in is that at least the difference in what they needed as the down payment or the land transfer tax, that savings that they're going to get are going to help them get into the market. But how are you feeling just like overall now, like about what's happening? I think it is normal. Like yeah. everyone always seems to forget and just piles on, like if it's a gravy train, very bullish or, you know, any site of uh, slowdown, they're all bearish. But when you boil down like what real estate is about, it's just about having a roof over your head. If you need a roof over your head, go get a roof over your head, right? Like I always tell my clients, I'm like, if you're trying to get into a public school because uh, your kid is turning four, right? Now is a great time because you don't have to compete with everybody. Just go buy the house. Who cares if you pay an extra 10, 20, 30,000 or pay less 10, 20, 30,000? Because you can constantly be timing the market where you can just focus your efforts on something else totally, completely, right? And everyone thinks they could time the market and everyone wants to um, think they could beat the market. But this is why I tell everyone all the time. In our market, when you work with freeholds, there's always a seasonal change. So I put this in my video later, uh, latest in August to September, that month to month change, only with the exception of one month in 26 years, which was the 9-11 uh, year, prices always go up from August to September. Hmm. And a metric that ties it to it is because the freehold homes come up and they drag the average price up, right? But I'd say this every single year in every single video, whenever I have people looking in the summer, I'm like, look, you're going to be in for a price shock come September because the house you want is going to be higher than what you think. Happens every single year. I say the exact same thing from December to January, most of the year, because everyone's in Christmas time. They put off their things to, for buying a home in January for a while. 
And then it's always like all the buyers come in and like January 1st, kind of like, you know, um, like a new year's resolution, right? New year, new me, new body, new house, right? And everyone comes in and as listing agents, you know that none of the listings show up on January 1st. It's always March break. So I yeah. see this all the time. And I'm always just telling people like, if you need a home, get a home, put a roof over your head. Yeah, man. You're speaking our language. Like life happens. People need to do things. Yeah. It's actually, it's actually kind of funny because, um, you're right. Like the two best months, if you're looking to purchase a home, the two best months financially are August and December. Yep. Right. Yep. They always, always are every single year. This year in my market with what's going on, I mean, we're in the, I'm in the burbs, right? So it's, it's much more leveraged. We don't have these lower price. Like I was looking at South Langley and they went from like 2 million. Now this is average price. We all know that I, Tom knows for sure that I don't report on average price, but it went from like 2 million 50 to like under 1.4 since the, uh, since the peak, right? Now that's average price because the bottom end properties sell. Yeah. Benchmark hasn't quite done that, but it's been substantial. So that's a 30% right off of the peak. Um, I, so I don't personally see an uptrend in my marketplace uh, over September and October, but you bring up another good point, which is, and I tell my clients this every single year, I send out a message about December 15th you want to hit the market between January 2nd and January 5th. The reason you want to do that is because you're the best thing in town. Yeah. And all those people, like you mentioned, right? Like you've got all these agents that are like, last year sucked. I'm going to have the best year ever. Yes. yes and then, yes. and then you've got all these people like, yeah, I'm going to like, what do I do every year? January 1st, January 2nd. Let's not lie. Third, I'm going wow. to lose 20 pounds. I'm going to lose 20 pounds right now. Right. I do. So the people do that with houses and every single year we have about four to five houses come on in that first week of January and they're all sold by the second week of January. Then our clients get to go out and take their time and wait for those properties to come on end of February. And they still get a long closing, like long closings are not hard to negotiate at all. And then they get to pick from the best of the bunch. Right. So I don't know. It's an it's interesting uh, t uh, kind of tip that you can be in such a different market than me or, or so far away and, and see the exact same things. I think it's human psychology. I think most of real estate is. It's all in our heads. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. These decisions, uh, it's emotional, right? Yeah, totally. It's like it's your forever home. And even when it comes to investment, unless you're like a hardcore investor and you just only look at numbers, at the end of the day, there's a reason why you're buying real estate, right? And it's always going to be emotional. And if you're kind of like trying to get it over with as well, I, I find the first few listings in the start of the year, they actually set the precedent for the listings afterwards. And I, yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why spring prices go up because everyone kind of crowds in in like January and February and there's not much. And then it's always like, oh, that guy got this. I'm going to sell for this plus X, right? It is that like herd mentality, right? Oh, I gotta Absolutely. be, I, I gotta do everything in the spring. It's the best time. I'm like, that's the best time for sales. That's the best time for agents. Yeah. Is it the best time for price? For sure not, right? Like August and December. Nobody wants to buy in December. If your house is on the market in December, so let's think of this from a buyer's point of view. Your what? Your, your house? house? Your, uh, did I, did <laughs> extra, I say it extra Canadian today? Dude, I did a video the other day and I was talking about my birthday and I said the wrong day. I am a moron. Okay. So, if if your house is on the market in December, house is on the market in December, you are on the market for a reason. Nobody wants to be on the market in December, right? You need to sell. Yeah. You want to get sold. So as a buyer, you would be silly to wait until, you know, January, February, March. Sure, there's more to pick from, but that's not where the deals are if the only thing that matters is, is the price and the deal, right? Yeah, Zen, you, you, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was say you mentioned something earlier that I wrote down here. I want to ask you about again. So you talked about pre-construction assignment sales. So someone buys four years ago, market's going up. It's all looking good. They buy for 13, 1400 bucks a square foot. Now rates are double what they were when they purchased. They can't close. Pre-con assignments are everywhere right now, but are, are very, very difficult to move. What's, what have you been seeing on that side of the market? 
This episode of the Tom Story Show is brought to you by the Story Team at Royal Page Signature in Toronto, Ontario. The Story Team focuses on satisfying all of their clients' wants and needs when either buying or selling real estate in the GTA. But don't take my word for it, they have way over a hundred five-star reviews on Google from clients singing their praises after amazing home purchases and sales. From downtown Toronto condos to semis to detached homes, whatever your needs, Tom and his team promise to provide an educated, honest, and transparent approach to helping all of their clients achieve their financial and personal goals through real estate. So there is no need to search bus benches or newspaper ads anymore to find the right agent for you. Just visit www.storyteam.ca to book a call with the Story Team today. That's S-T-O-R-E-Y-T-E-A-M.ca. That's storyteam.ca. This communication is not intended to cause or induce breach of any existing agency agreement. Um, so I have our team looking and scavenging everywhere for anyone who looks distressed, right? Mm-hmm. And for anyone who's kind of trying, you're trying to basically fight our original price. So you're basically buying the three to four year time, assuming the project you bought came out at a reasonable price, right? So we did a deal um, at E2 and it was like original price and they sold at 2017 last week. And it was just like a smoking deal because you're at like 1050 a foot at Midtown, right? Mm-hmm. But you still have a lot of people who aren't um, trying to let go of it at original price up because the occupancy date hasn't coming up. But the biggest kind of, I think, concern I generally have in this market is anyone who bought and was, can I swear and like say certain things on this? Is there like any censorship? <laughs> go for it. Okay. So like when you have a lot of like pre-con agent schlucking things and you have in their marketing that says free mortgage approval. Do you know what that means in layman's term? Hey, I got a guy who's going to write you a mortgage letter that's not legit based on your income to buy this thing. You just have to put your deposit down and I'll flip it for you later. We have so many of those guys out there right now and they don't know what to do. They're panic selling. I've even seen some uh, assignments where the uh, asking price is lower than the purchase price. So they're going to have to pay into the deal when they close. It's wild. And it scares me a lot because I think there was so much of this in like early 20 or sorry, late 2020, where everyone's just jumping into the pre-con trade at such a high price point. It really concerns me where we're going to be in like three to four years. Can these things close? I've always kind of quietly had my concerns with the pre-con side of things um, because I didn't like what I was seeing, but I didn't want to voice it too much because I, I didn't know what the result was going to be. Um, and like, I, and by the way, to be clear, like I know many pre-con agents who I respect highly, who are doing things the right way, like you, like Jordan, like jazz in my office, like there's some killers out there that are really damn good at what they do. Um, and aren't giving that type of advice, but the public needs to know pre-construction agents make 4% commission, resale agents make two and a half. Why do you think they're pushing you towards a project? And why is every project they're launching the greatest thing ever? There's something that's wrong here. Like it, it always rubbed me the wrong way. I don't. I think they worked on a trans a lot of them. And again, I don't want to get myself in too much trouble here, but like they worked on a fully transactional business. There was no relationship involved. It was, I want in, I want you to get this because I make this. And, and I had a problem with that and I got a little bit of pushback from people, but not really. And because up to the last four years, it didn't matter because you made so much money buying pre-con that it didn't matter. Now what's going to happen. Everybody looks like a genius in a bull market. Yeah. And it's when the tides turn where they're like, oh, crap, I got bad advice. And that's what I'm feeling a lot of calls for. They're like, Zen, how did I deal with this? I'm like, dude, I can't control this contract. You either sign out a loss or you've got to figure it out, right? And, and why aren't I they calling actually... the agent that helped them buy it? I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but yes, there's yeah, a lot don't, of that. Don't. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but like, I can say this for a fact because um, when we got into pre-con, like, uh, it made sense because it was like always a little bit of a premium. So we're buying stuff, you know, resale was like at 900 in like 2016. Your pre-con was like 950. I think it was in 2018 in February. I remember this project specifically. We're looking at Theater District, which is, Steve, for you, it's like in the prime district of downtown where all the kids used to go party. It was called Entertainment District because that's where all the clubs were, right? But now it's just like, you know, young professionals and stuff. So we, I remember a condo specifically was selling for, I think, 1050 a foot. And then after February 2018, just like 
two minute walk, the same condo was selling for $1,200 a foot because the city of Toronto doubled development charges mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. So at $1,200 a foot, when resale was trading at like a thousand, it's like, this doesn't make sense. You're paying a 20% premium. Let's assume the market gets there, but if you under appraise or your rents don't match up to your cash flow, because at that rate, like a hundred thousand, sorry, a thousand dollars meant you had to get another dollar in rent per foot. I'm like, that's not happening in five years. I'm like, this just makes no investment sense. So I stopped at that point for investors, right? It was only for end users. But as it kept creeping higher and higher and higher, it's like, I think we're going to have a problem very soon because like we're going to have major, major closing issues if we don't have like a massive bull run. Well, because most people weren't buying these properties as their primary residence, right? Like they were marketed to investors. Correct. And what you brought up before with the, hey, let's just get this mortgage approval letter to get pre-approved here. I'll figure it out in four years. Well, guess what? Four years is about to happen. Yeah. And, and it's going to be interesting. Um, yeah. But if you were that far away, like if you were 2018, the run up since then has got to be crazy and you got to be fine. I mean, it you depends think. on what you bought. It depends on what you bought, right? So I'll give you an idea. We have some clients selling some projects we bought just for personal reasons. They're not going to be the country. Um, they still still making, making profit. We bought at like 950. The resale market is like 12, 13 right now. They're fine. But the same year, there were projects that came in more expensive at like 1100. And those guys are underwater right now and selling for less. So it really depends on what the purchase price was. Because in the market that's really strong, and, and sometimes, you know, you get all those like free gifts and stuff, like that stuff gets pushed on to people so much because they yeah. think they're going to sign this really easily. They're like, oh, cool. If I buy this right now, you know, I get a, what was it? Like, you get a purse or something, or you get like, um, I forgot what was the one. I think I saw someone give away a Porsche or something, but like, this was like a super high end building. It was yeah. Black. Can you imagine if, can you imagine if the resale market did that? At your open house, you have like a Louis sitting on the counter and you're like, buy this house it should be like enshrined in a glass thing with like led lights around it just right door in the opens upon firm transaction <laughs> right in the living room on your 1970s house that's never had an update right you get a louis vuitton person like that we used to see that in 2010 there was a development here that took eight years to sell i want to say like they took a loss maybe seven years to sell the whole thing was a big development but they were offering at one point if you sold, I think it was two or three units in there to the realtor, it was like a car. It was like, we will buy you a 35 at the time, $40,000 car. If you, I'm like, I don't know how that gets disclosed. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. But I don't know. I just couldn't see that translating. But when you're buying pre-con, that's like going to a store and buying a car rather than going to a house and buying a home. Right? Well, I mean, your, your, job, your down payment could be less than the car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the crazy part um, for like, I, I don't do a lot of, of pre-sales. Um, don't even do a lot of pre-construction or, or any sort of new construction, mostly uh, residential resale. Have you guys ever worked in a market or have you ever seen a market where you are, where the product is built first? Because that's like, what I came out of, I, I remember there was a fellow in my office that did, uh, I think it was Parkwood home, uh, complex. It was townhouse complex. It took him four years to sell 200 units. They can't start, years. they can't start building in Ontario unless they've sold out. I think it's 70%. Right. Is that what it yeah. is done? Yeah. So you, they won't give you financing on it unless you sold a certain amount. So when I find where there's big launches and, and I think, um, I follow some of Jordan's stuff too. Like, I think he's probably the guy to ask, right? Because he's still doing this. Like, this was years ago because I stopped in 2018 or so. But like, if you don't get the amount of sales, the bank will uh, give you construction financing. So the only guys who can actually build are the guys with big pockets, right? So like your big time builders. And I have seen like a decent amount of inventory in some uh, pockets where big builders built them, but they're just holding on to them. And then they'll just build it because they got all the trades in. And then they'll just slowly offload it. So I have seen some of that. Like Tridel yeah. can do that because they don't need the financing, right? Like they, yeah. they'll sometimes yeah. just start and they'll have purpose built built into it as well. So it's not a big deal for them. Yeah. Also, like um, the big guys have stuff land banked for a long time. So their cost to service the land is like insignificant. 
One thing I, I want to kind of change tune here a little bit because I don't want to be a uh, whole episode on pre-con, although we, oh, right. we yeah. could probably <laughs> do that. And, and by the way, like there's a lot of great pre-con agents. I bought pre-con in 2018 and I made a bunch of money on it. It was an amazing investment. I just think you have to pick the right ones Correct. Um, yeah. and, and work with the right people. And I know that sounds obvious, but just going to say that again. Okay. Uh, something that we haven't chatted about yet, which is potentially going to happen, according to RBC, to 80,000 mortgages just from RBC on September the 7th is the trigger rate. So, wait, do we know, Tom, when the trigger, like, is it a quarter point, uh, a half point, a three quarter point? It, it depends it, it, on when you got the, over. yeah, it depends on when you got the mortgage and at what point it goes over not covering all the interest, right? So I just wonder what the actual result of that will be and how many people will get triggered. Because this is this is a scary part for me in seeing this year, because this is the first time I've seen this in my career where rates went up so fast. Obviously, all of us have ne probably never seen that before. So fast, it hasn't happened since 1981. Um, but the amount of people that took variable on a gamble in what was obviously an increasing rate you know, scenario, the Bank of Canada said, hey, we're increasing rates and they're still taking it just because they qualified for more. It's kind of terrifying. It, it, it definitely is. But like, I think when they were picking it, the spread was like 100 bits. So it kind of made sense at the time. And nobody, I don't even think, was it Scotia that came out with like um, eight. eight rate hikes? Yeah. And we're way over that right now, assuming each rate hike is 25 bits. Like no one saw this coming. I don't even think like Tiff Macklin knew saw this coming. Yeah. There's no way. The pulling it. No. There's no way. They saw yeah, the inflation it. reports, and then they saw what the Fed did, and then they said, all right, giddy up. The, the only reason we got 1% last time is because the inflation report in the U.S. came out at 9.1% that morning. They were going to be like, oh, it's 75, it's 75, it's 75. And then they were like, uh-oh. And then they went, okay, let's ratchet it up. So that's what I'm interested. I don't know if there's a new inflation report scheduled for September 7th or not, but I I have a kind of a prediction on, uh, well, this is going to spoiler alert my tomorrow video, but like, it's just a matter of like, okay, if it's 50 points, that to me signals the bottom of the market is soon. Yeah. If it's 75, we're going to continue to see the slide. If it's one, like that's the nuke. I, I actually think there's a higher probability we're going to get one than we're going to get 50. Really? Agreed. Yeah. I think on Friday, uh, Powell came out and just dropped the bomb in Jackson. Oh, man. Oh, my God. And, like, I looked at some of the kind of, like, uh, it's a basically people placing bets on what it is, right? And, like, so much of the market is skewing to 100 points, 100 points now. I'm like, yeah. Jesus Christ. Can we yeah, legally the, um, bet on the rate hike? Is that, like, a Vegas odds thing? Oh, it's got it, to be, right? <laughs> There, there is a way to do it, but it's like not a financial instrument that like okay. we as normal people are able to do. Uh, he wants to know if he can go to the Monte Carlo in Vegas and go to, up to the sports book and, and bet on it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> hey, last week on the, uh, just on this show, I was like, hey, man, my investments are doing fantastic, right? And then, yeah, uh, we had the whole, what is it? Where is he? Jackson Hole, wherever the hell that is. I don't even know where that is. No, right? Yeah. It sounds like a terrible place to be, by the way. <laughs> and... It, yeah, it's like grenaded everything, and I think my my stocks this week have felt. What like did he say? 10%. I didn't see that. What did he actually say? He basically came out and said, "We're going to look at inflation number, but expect more pain." He said pain. Yeah, yeah he literally said pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and then oh, no. everything just went the other way because they were hoping that with inflation kind of doing that curve last month that it did in the states, that everything would kind of start calming down so everybody dumped their money back into the market and then he came out and was like oh no guys we're not done and then everybody pulled their money back out of the market now here's the here's the the cool thing for me i'm looking at the stocks that are just steady downward trend at the moment and i'm like man my my buy-in day is coming up in in about 10 days like when i when i balance my books and everything i hope it's still there because man there's some canadian banks right now i know their profits were off but those stocks are looking fantastic right now, right? So it's it's really interesting to, I, I am of the mindset, like if, if I liked that investment last week, where the stock prices are now, I really like that investment, right? Because mm -hmm. it's going to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've got at least 20 years before I retire. So buy as much as I possibly can in this crap market, because in 20, it, the downturn is not going to last for 20 years. Sorry, commenters. 
uh, down. You're going to retire at 100? <laughs> you know, Tom, considering you got out of high school last week. Can I, if anyone's watching. Wait, wait, is, is Steve a boomer? No. Just, men- just I am mentally. On- just in my his bad, head. <laughs> do, you know, do you know the cutoff line for, for millennial? Do you know the year? I think it's, it's uh, 84. Uh, I think millennials can be 40, 41. I was told, I was told at one point the millennial line between whatever the previous one was and, and millennials was 1980. I was born in 1980. So I don't know which side of that line I'm on. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt. We will honorary put you as a millennial, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, go, cool me- kids. <laughs> I'll, I'll go get a Starbucks and an avocado. I don't know if I'll be you good. guys can see if you're watching on video, but like I, so I turned 31 a month ago and I've been a dad for eight months now. First, first of all, I can't even still grow a real beard. Like it won't connect, but the grays have creeped. Like they're already showing up. So either being in real estate has done this to me or, or at some point, like I'm just catching up to Steve here. I, Tom, I just had this conversation last night. We went on, my wife and I went on a date together. And I was like, I've just realized today that never in my life will I be able to grow a proper beard. I will be the man for that. Like, that is my curse At in least life. you guys could grow some semblance <laughs> of facial hair. I can't connect anything. And, like, I got, like, little bits here and there. Like, I'm growing hair thicker, but it's just in the same spots and nothing connects. Yeah. Well, well yeah. this is... This is not going to be a, a, our sponsor is not brought to you by beard oil today. Let's oh, go. sorry. Yeah. No. Okay. So let's bring it back. So trigger rates. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Trigger are rates, you concerned now? Bad. Do you think it's going to make, our trigger rates going to actually Wait, wait. Impact? Real estate podcast. Real estate podcast. Let's get back to it. Sorry. Yeah. So trigger rate. I knew about it earlier because my wife is in audit and we, she read through all the mortgage documents we signed for investment properties. Right. Mm. And I was like, oh, what is this thing? So when I saw the rates high, I made a video about it. And I think it's being talked more and more about it. But one of the things I've realized in the last little bit is I talked to my broker at RBC and CIBC. And if you think about what a bank is, all they care about is collecting the interest, right? So as long as you make your interest payment and you make, I think, $1 of principal, they don't care. So you can go by the officer rule. So if you kind of say, say you're at, I don't know, $2,000 a month and you, now your interest payment is 2050 as long as you make $2,052, you're not going to have to sell. The problem that's going to come up is on these renewals, you're going to be five years behind on your amortization. Because like I looked at mine and I'm like, oh, cool. 59 year amortization. That's fine. Because <laughs> <laughs> like at some point when you're not paying anything, it's like a log grab. It's basically it gets to infinity, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I actually think the trigger rates are a big nothing burger. Do you guys remember, uh, what was it like six months after uh uh, pandemic, so I don't say the word so you guys get demonetized in case. Uh, after the pandemic, not monetized. Um, <laughs> hey man, I don't know where you guys are going to go later. We're, hey, we'll be there soon. By the way, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. We're we're trying to get to a thousand oh. by the end of the year. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you guys are watching this, make sure you like and subscribe. These guys put out great content. There we go. There we go. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, it's like I, I think it's going to be like that uh, uh, mortgage deferral cliff. Remember, everyone was like, "Oh my mm. god, everything is going to fall apart." I think that's what the trigger rate is going to be because. If you called to your bank, and I did this because when my clients and I were talking about it, and I'm like, this is my broker said, but you, they, you have to call into the bank to figure out what it is. They're like, yeah, these are your payments you have to do. And they weren't telling me that I could just pay an extra dollar. So when I kind of asked more questions, they're like, yeah, you could do that. Okay, interesting. So, so I think what's going to happen is like people are going to get scared. They're going to go automatic on fixed. And I think that's what the banks want. But I don't think the banks are going to stop them from just making essentially what is interest only payments on your mortgage. And on top of all of that, anybody that is in that trouble has been stress tested at at least 2% higher. So if you did get that 2% mortgage, 1.5% mortgage, you were stress tested uh, last year at least at 475. So you should still be able to make all of your mortgage payments just fine. It's the other spending you're going to have to sacrifice on. And I am, I've said it before on, on this show, I'm totally okay with a bunch of people learning that they have to be financially responsible. And if I'm sorry, if you can't afford the trip to Disneyland, pay for your house, right? Like that's what it comes down to for me. Uh, unfortunately, we've just grown up over the last 20 years of thinking, 
you don't really have to be that responsible because if you need to just refinance your house and take out a bigger mortgage to pay for your credit card bill. Yeah. But I think the thing with Canadians is that they're always going to make the mortgage payment. So you want to look for delinquencies in the credit cards, right? Because if you start borrowing from like credit cards to pay off the mortgage, I think that's when we have going to be some systemic issues. And when people were getting uh, mortgages initially for these variable rates, they were getting them at what they started at like 1.5%, even lower. Now they're up at like four, some four and a half. They could be over five by next week. Yeah. Um, and, but, and what Steve said is they were still stressed at 5.25. So we're just going to get to the point that they were stressed at. Now, an article that came out recently said that more and more GTA home buyers are turning to private lenders. And that's what concerns me because because it's like before, at least you were stressed at this, okay, trigger rate, but you were stressed to this point. And, but now if you want to get a mortgage, well, it's already 5%, you're being stressed at 7%. So now you can't qualify for what you want to try to buy or just what you could buy. And then you're going to private lending at who knows what percent with, yeah. with no stress tests and crazy returns. And like that, that concerns me more than any of the stuff going through the bank and the lenders that are actually like have people overlooking what they're doing. Yeah, that part's scary. Even if you look at B lenders, like where you were buying at three or four percent. So let's say someone's self-employed, you go B lender, and now they're renewing at seven percent already, and you have to like you're double, you're actually more than doubling your payment. I think that's kind of where we're seeing a lot of the fire sales. But like mm -hmm. most people who are in late A lenders, unless like you put your mom, your dad, your uncle, and your aunt on the mortgage, like you should be okay. Like Steve said, based on the stress test. The private money thing is in my market. I think it's going to become. I don't want to say a substantial issue, but it will register because there were so many people. I was talking to a guy uh, in the office. So this is for sure the truth. I was talking to the guy in the office yesterday who was like, I was losing deals because there were mortgage brokers that were saying, listen, we're going to get this deal together for you uh, to, to the clients, but you have to use our agent. Huh. We're going to, we're going uh -oh. to put it together. But then when he, you know, he got calls from these people, you know, three, four months after they closed, it was all private money and something happened where, you know, they were basically putting up, the client wasn't fully informed of exactly what they were doing and they didn't understand the consequences of private money is a one year deal. There's two percentage points or whatever paid up front. Like they didn't understand what they were doing. And now within the next six months, they're going to come into a spot where, Oh, not, you know how you couldn't qualify at, at, you know, four, five and a quarter. Well, you're not going to qualify at seven and a quarter. So the question is, what happens to those people? I think that that is a legitimate issue that we're going to come into next spring, in my market anyway. Well, it's about when the maximum volume of the transaction happened, right? So the bunch of stuff came in February and March and closing. The renewal period at these higher rates that we sustain it will be like that time, right? So if anyone is kind of quote unquote waiting, you have to kind of see what the spring market brings. Because I think we saw some stress in September, August, because last summer was actually pretty strong. And those B lenders are when you renewal this year and like maybe they're just scathing by. Cause like I saw some wicked deals on like homes because like I asked my mortgage broker to pull the mortgage on it. Cause I suspected, I'm like, there's no way they're paying for this. Right. And I pulled it and I was like, yeah, these guys are not B lender based on <clears throat> who the funder is. Right. So I can, when I pull that, I can see a lot of people were actually renewing. They actually had to sell. So mm -hmm. what you're saying right now on private for anyone who's like, okay, the market's going to be fine. We closed in February, March. And that one year renewal is going to be 2023 in March and April. And I do think there's going to be some pain there as well. Do you know what I just want to mention quickly too? And this is more to the real estate community, not so much the consumers the, or the public that watches this. But if you're a real estate agent and you are helping someone that's in a tough situation sell their property and they bought a year and a half ago and they're negative equity right now and they have two mortgages and then they have a private, even if you do your job and sell your house, guess where the real estate commissions ends in terms of being paid? You are the last one. And if there's no money left, you don't get paid. So yeah. and I, I'm not saying that, like, trust me, some people be like, good realtors don't deserve it. Fine. But I'm just saying that ha you need to do these numbers up front with your client and show them um, what's left at the end of the day if you sell for a certain price and who's getting paid in what order. Yeah, yeah I think I mean, a lot of people haven't been in that type of market before. Uh, yeah. I For sure. I remember all the way up until 2015, we constantly had to check to see if everybody could clear title. We were always asking like, you know, what do you owe? 
what are the pen- we would have to phone the bank sometimes and be like, okay, what's the penalty? Because there was a lot of people that couldn't clear title or came very close to not clearing title. Right. I've even done, I know Tom mentioned it, uh, a couple shows ago that, you know, you've never, I think with Melanie, you've never done a foreclosure. Right. Not through uh, the bank. Like I did, a, a, there was a private one once, but not really. Yeah. yeah. So I've done three short sales. Ooh. That's pre foreclosure where we go to the bank and I actually bought one of them. Um, the, it's where, yeah, 100% it was. It's where you go to the bank and you're like, listen, I know this client of mine or whoever is not paying the bills. I've, I've, they're trying to sell. I've got an offer from someone, someone, the numbers don't make sense. You're going to lose 20, 30, 40, 50 grand. Do you want to drag this into foreclosure where it'll sell for that much less plus fees, plus lawyers, plus everybody else. And the banks are like, bring me a subject free offer from the buyer and we will sign it. I've done that three times. The the YouTube commenters are like, foreclosures are coming. Everything's foreclosed. Lehman Brothers, Canada, here it comes, right? That is not uh, even close. It could come in the future, who knows? But it is not even close because in the early part of my career, we were three to four for, uh, bank foreclosures per year just on our team, right? So I, I'm doing my first bank foreclosure right now in four years Mm. right so we have done about a foreclosure a year since uh in those four years but you know who they're actually doing the foreclosing it's the strata corporations oh interesting yeah so the person is paying their mortgage but they haven't been paying their strata fees oh that is super interesting so i mean one of them was for like forty five thousand dollars. another foreclosure was for like five grand crazy right so it wasn't much now they were also if you're not paying your bills, you're not always the best person in the building. So I think that, that were, there was some motivation there to get those people out of the building. Are you going to say me. which building it is, Steve? <laughs> uh, not, my current, not my current one, but the other ones were, I mean, there were some interesting situations. One of them, the guy removed a load-bearing wall on the second floor of a, of a four-story building Jesus. for his renovation because he didn't ask for strata approval. Uh, or whatever he bought i think he even bought the place cash but and there was no mortgage but uh he was such a problem and wasn't paying his strata fees that the strata got him out oh my goodness these are some like crazy things that you hear at the talk about agents which is what i kind of like about what you guys do on your podcast because it's kind of like we all go about doing our own thing but there's so many crazy stories that we encounter that it's just insane you can't yeah. write it no but, but no but wait then isn't Every single day, just you showing rich couples, beautiful $5 million houses, and you show up in your Mercedes and they pull up in their G wagon and you guys just laugh at how other people can't afford homes as they walk by your mansions. Isn't that your everyday real estate life? Totally is. Would love it if that were actually true. It's always, I don't want people to realize the amount of fires we have to put out is just insane. Yeah. yeah. But the thing I find is, in a bull market, you can really get anyone to do anything, right? And you can get anyone to sell anything because people just throw offers at you. So that's where you get like commission compression, right? Like we had guys in my neighborhood putting up signs for like, we'll list the place for 0.5% commission. And I'm like, okay, cool. I can't compete with that, right? Mm-hmm. But then in a market where things are turning and kind of like some of the stories are sharing, because we have these stories, we know how to navigate this. I think that's kind of where finally our experience is coming into play because we've seen some of these things happen before and now they're like oh crap i'm in this position how do i get out of it and, and that's kind of why like um i think when tom's like oh you want to come on the bus i'm like yeah i would love to because this is just one of those things where like we can learn from one another and i would imagine most of your audience is realtors and i hope that anyone who's listening that's a realtor can learn because as altruistic as it sounds i really hope that we get better realtors in the industry because our reputation as like agents is complete trash and there are reasons for it yeah. too. but this community that we have now is making it better right I this so. on, this online community so. even with the terrible thumbnails that both you and i partake in zen um, wait, wait, wait. I, I got this in my my yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna put that on the thumbnail for this i need you to send me a picture um <laughs> I mean, I think we are showing that, yeah, there are knowledgeable people out there, but you have to put that 
crap on your on your thumbnail to to get people to click because nobody's going to be like here's the reason you should or here's how to pay down your home better or faster or the better financial decision nobody's ever going to click on that stuff it they got cl- they got to click on on <clears throat> the shock value yeah. kind of of it all right i had a problem doing that before <clears throat> excuse me and then one of my mentors was like then you got to have your marketing so outrageous and so loud that <clears throat> When the clients are under your care, you'll take care of them. Mm-hmm. But until you can actually get their attention, no matter how good you are or what or how good your intentions are, they're not going to work with you because you were not loud enough in your marketing. Yeah. So we have to do these things if people are wondering why, because it's like my kind of ethics and you know fiduciary right to take care of our clients. But if I don't make sure that they're under my wing, then they go off of somebody else and they make the mistakes. That's how I look at it now. And that's what I've recognized, by the way, from doing the YouTube stuff is, a, and I'm sure you get this as well. I, a lot of the calls I get that says, Hey, I just did this with not you. Yeah. Did I do the right thing? I'm like, yeah. well, could have saved yourself a lot of time by calling me from the beginning, but they would, they would normally say like, Oh, I just found you last week or something. Or, um, it's very interesting, but everything you just said, I completely agree with. And that's something that I preach a lot, especially when I speak with real estate agents, like it doesn't matter how good you are. If nobody knows who you are. Exactly. You, you have to play the game. And there's a middle ground here between putting out an outrageous headline that gets 50,000 views versus a video that gets 2,000 views, but 10 people reach out because you really help their situation. Um, yeah, and I think exactly. that's what game we're all playing right now is, is feeding the ego with views versus actually putting out information that will get less clicks, but the people watching are like, I want to work with you because you just solved my issue. Yeah. And like, I think I can give an example. Like when I, talked about the distress uh, pre-con sellers and a lot of people found themselves in that particular situation. My calendar just got filled up with calls all saying distress pre-con buyer. Cause like I always ask which video did you prompt me to pick the call? And that one, cause I was solving an issue for people. They all called in for that reason. Granted, I didn't get much transaction out of it, but at least I could point them in some way direction and just put some good vibes out there. And they want to work with me later than I, they can. Right. I was going to ask you that as well. So in terms of right now in your business, um, what is the percentage that you are getting in that people find you on YouTube? Like what percentage wise of the amount of transactions you do, is it becoming a larger percentage than ever has been before? Well, my business is a little bit different from, I think, what um, you guys do, right? Because you guys follow um, uh, Richard Robbins philosophy, which by the way, sorry, video, I've been to this thing. He's great. Highly yeah. recommend you guys go check it out. I've been to those events. They're really good. You want to network with people who are really good at what they do because it comes in handy later. Um, But for me, I have a lot of investor clients. So Mm. they're very repeat. So when I look at my business, you have to understand the lifetime value of your customer. So the lifetime value of my customer as an investor is a lot because I would say my cost of acquisition is higher, um, but the amount of transaction I get, it's much more frequent than someone who's just moving up or doing a first time home buyer. Right. So half of my business is about like repeat. I would say like 30% comes from YouTube and then the other rest is like referral. And what got you started on YouTube? Cause I think you've been doing it longer than us. Um, I remember stumbling across your videos when I was kind of getting started with it. So like, what was the, the moment that you were like, Oh, I have to do this because this is where the eyeballs are. And there's a better chance of someone finding me online than driving by my for sale sign on a random street in Toronto. It was a total accident, total accident. I was, yeah. um, I kept saying the same thing to the same people because I was selling pre-con. So I literally just uploaded videos so that I could make my sales cycle and funnel it more efficient. I'd be like, they call me about this project because in pre-con, it's always about the numbers game, right? Like basically how much you pay for ads, how much you get in the transaction and you just do the math. It's very simple, right? It's just a volume yeah. game. Um, but what I realized was I kept spending the same amount of time, like 10, 20 minutes explaining the project or explaining the pros and cons of pre-con. So I basically just made a video, put it on YouTube. I'm like, here, watch this and I'll call you back in 10 minutes. That's what it originated from. Mm-hmm. And when I did a couple of those videos, that was my idea. I actually had a buddy who told me to get my license. So shout out to Peter. He was, I think, one of the OGs on YouTube. Okay. And, and he's like, uh, oh, yeah, I want you to just talk about the, um, what do you call it, uh, the market as well. I'll help you, right? Because that's what he was doing. So I followed in his footsteps. And I remember I actually drove to his place to borrow his lapel mic. Because I was like, how the hell do you get this audio thing to go? And I was like trying to pin it in. And I like 
they had those weird circle CV batteries I could take out with the ribbon. So that's actually how I got started. It was just total accident. That's so cool. I mean, and now you've grown to, uh, you know, you have over 10,000 subscribers now, which is insane. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully One day me and Steve will get there. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. No, I'm sure you guys will. You guys put out great content, right? Like, I, I think for me, I try not to listen to too much of other people's stuff, right? Because then it's just like a echo chamber. Yeah. But I can say I definitely like and subscribe to your stuff, Tom. Thank you. I can't say the same about you, Steve, but I will check out your stuff. My bad. You're not in my market, man. <laughs> Don't uh, unless you got a terrible sense of humor. Do not subscribe to my stuff. <laughs> I love. I do love uh, how you just said you got thirty percent of your business because you were sick of repeating yourself, though. Because that's what you were doing, right? I mean, uh, that was a portion of of uh, the reason for me putting my videos out. It was like I say this to one person every single day. Yeah. So instead, why not just say this once to a camera and then it can talk to a thousand people every day? Yeah. And then when you realize the scale of it, I was like, holy crap. This episode of the Tom Story Show is brought to you by the YouTube for Real Estate video course. Are you interested in creating an engaging, value driven YouTube channel to help educate your client base on real estate in your market, as well as introduce a new revenue stream to your business? Perhaps you've already created a YouTube channel, but are struggling to gain viewership and the subscribers you are looking for. The YouTube for Real Estate course will provide you with proven tips and strategies on how to create and cultivate an engaging YouTube channel, as well as how to optimize your channel, resulting in higher viewership, subscribers, and yes, deals. But that's not it. I implemented YouTube in my business in early 2021, and it has easily been the best marketing source for meeting new clients that I have ever had in my business, period. Better than expensive geo farming, internet marketing, and open houses combined. And now it even rivals my repeat and referral business. If you would like to learn all the tips and tricks for meeting new clients using YouTube, simply go to video course login or click the link in the description below and sign up for the YouTube for real estate course today and learn a year's worth of my painstaking research of learning how to use YouTube for real estate in just a few hours by taking the YouTube for real estate course. So go to videocourselogin.com right now and use the promo code TOMSHOW at checkout. Again, that's videocourselogin.com or simply use the link below. I remember hitting a thousand subscribers. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And like, it took forever to get there, right? But I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And I had um, people uh, reach out for me because I, you know, the realtor thing is you put your name and email and everything you do, right? The first person that called me, I was like, oh my God, this could actually be a source of business. But then like we had to get better at filtering because there are obviously, and you guys probably experienced it too. There are a lot of people who just want to kind of chit chat with you and, and it's good to provide them help. But you have to kind of yep. see where you can divert your time to help people who actually need it or you can generate business or there's people who are out there just to kind of get information out of you, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the space I work in because like I would say one of my superpowers is because I'm an investor myself. I know all the mortgage rules, the corporation, the tax and all that stuff because I have to personally do it. And I have tons of people calling me trying to get eff effectively free advice and I would help them. But then you can see they keep trying to learn more from me. You know, there's going to be no transaction. So I just basically started dropping retainer agreements on people and then never hear from them again. Yeah, yeah. I've got that. I've got that uh, at least twice this week. Yeah, easy. And, yeah. and one was like a phone call of like, there's this one website that we rank on um, where it like ranks agents and we're in like the top whatever. So I get, but it's for a very specific market. So when I get a random call from that market, I know they found me on that website and every single time they phone me, all they want me to do is rush over to their house right now and tell them the price. And the reason they want to do, I've, I've come very savvy to it now, but the reason they want me to do that is because they've already signed listing paperwork with somebody else yesterday. They mm -hmm. just want to know that before it hits tomorrow, that they've been told the right price. So now it's like, I ask all those questions. Are you talking to other people? You know, Ali, I've gone so far now as to just say, you know, are you very interested in actually selling your home? Or do you just want me to, you know, tell you kind of right now in the next 15 minutes about the ballpark? Right. And then as soon question. as I ask, as soon as I ask that question, the people that are not serious are like, I'll, I'll, I'll call you back another time, click. Because they realize that I've just figured out. I mean, you talk to so many people, 
you can tell who's doing what, right? You can tell if they're serious or not. And that is the downside is there are some people out there that just want to talk. I've got one guy that phones me every couple months and he just wants to have a half hour conversation. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I, I, like it's, I don't it's know. Sunday and I'm with my kids, man. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. Totally. How about you getting some of that from your stuff too? Oh, tons. It's not nonstop. Like, I mean, my calendar is always booked up. That's the one thing I think I figured out early with it is you have to have a call to action in the first 30 seconds of every video yeah. and has to be easy to book an appointment with you. And, and, and that's worked very well in my business. Uh, we've, I think now we're at 21 um, properties sold this calendar year from, from people that reached out on YouTube. Yeah, right. um, because you a, took my YouTube for real estate video course, Tom. Yeah, You're doing better than me in that. <laughs> is it that you actually have a plug for that each episode? It'll we be do. in here somewhere. It'll be edited in at some point. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> um, a, a few final questions I have for you, Zen. And by the way, thank you so much for coming on so far. This has been so much fun. Yes. Um, you are a broker of record at your own franchise, Remax. Just curious, why did you take that route? Why did you want to be the one who gets um, in trouble if someone else gets in trouble, like you're the person that signs the things. What was that mindset? It was an absolutely terrible idea and also <laughs> an accident as well, as with most things in my real estate career, now that I'm talking about it. I have basically was just operating solo or with like a team, kind of like yourself, right? Yep. Um, at a Remax. And then I was approached by somebody to open a brokerage as a partnership. Didn't turn out well. And then effect, but what I realized afterwards was, this was before we could incorporate. In Ontario. Could, yeah, yeah, in Ontario. I could keep my money in the corporation without gotcha. having all the other stuff before, which was an added value to the way I operate with my investment properties so that you're effectively investing with after corporate tax money, but pre-marginal tax rate. So you got an edge as an investor. So I just continued that. And then we had a larger team before and similar to it's like oh no this is way too much headache for me and everything and i was like i'm just gonna keep the team small unless it's people that I absolutely want to work with and just like overstaff the admin and help staff yeah that makes sense and i had another question for you so i ran a poll on my main channel um and i asked people when hiring a real estate agent to buy or sell do you care which company they work for because uh, I wanted the public's opinion. I didn't want real estate agents' opinion. And uh, 80% said they don't care. They it's, don't. The, it's the person. I think a few people said indifferent and a very small percentage said that the company that they work for matters. But it was a very, very small percentage with like over 200 votes now. Yeah, um, I've actually always been at really small firms. Yeah. So small that I moved to the Remax I was at because at the time, the builders who were doing pre-com when I was working on it were like, who are you? You're just like a small fish. So you have to go to a big brokerage before they gave you allocations. That was the reason I moved out of the one I was at before. So and, like, I actually don't think it makes any difference, but I can tell you in my, where I live in my market in York region, in the Chinese community, you have to be at a Remax for a certain age of culturally mm -hmm. type of person to work with you because their thought process, and it's always very financial driven is if you can't survive in a high fee brokerage, you don't do enough transaction. That's the only time that's actually kind of played in my favor being at a That's rematch. interesting. Yeah, but most of the time, like I would say like, you know, your Western kind of millennials, they don't care. They don't even and know. The, they think my brokerage is prime properties TO. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, people don't even know who I work for. They like, they don't even yeah. ask. Um, uh, do you think a little bit of inside baseball here, but do you think these new companies, I always talk with Steve about this offline, um, whether it be EXP, Real Broker, uh, there are many, many others that have this downline where agents can earn passive income that is not just selling and, and stock options and blah, blah, blah. Do you think there's a future for them? Do you think they're eventually going to be competing? Because right now, you know, success leaves clues. All the top producers in in my market are still with big brands. Um but the young guys or gir and girls are kind of getting into these. These there's a, this is a run-on question. What do, you, what do you think about these cloud brokerage models? Okay, so I'm actually probably the perfect person you could ask because yeah. while a little bit when I was doing commercial real estate, I was in a network marketing with like the previous person I was with. So I can tell you the mindset of it. I don't think it's going to work because if you are really good at what you're doing, 
why are you selling what you're doing to other people, right? That's the biggest thing. Let's just say your average commission in Toronto right now is 20 grand, right? And you just get full pop. How much downline and how many people do you have to recruit versus just selling a condo or a house to make the same amount of money? And these cloud-based uh, brokerages are basically trying to get at the millennial generation and like I'll group you and I with it, right? Where they don't want to work. It's all about passive income. How do I find passive income, make the most amount of money, do the least amount of work and just live life. And I think those are the people who are going into these kind of like downline type of brokerages. But if you're just good at what you do, like say you're a top producer like us, you're going to make way more money than mm. what you can actually do by recruiting people. Because what people don't understand is when you recruit people, you have to manage and make sure they're successful for you to be successful. So that's what I realized with my team. Anyone that I bring on needs to do a certain volume. Otherwise, I just won't keep you around because I have to keep kind of like, say, managing your one or two transactions. But I get tons of calls from you for making mistakes or I get complaints from you. It's not worth my time financially as an incentive model, right? Because show me the incentive and I'll show you the results. So if I've always been the proponent, if you do results, I'm not going to charge you much, but you're just a good asset to the company. And those are the type of agents that I don't think are going to be going into these kind of like um, recruiting style models of brokerages. I think these recruiting style models, although this will never happen because it hurts their business model, they should have a, you have to be this many years in the industry or have this much generation of business every year, do this much commissions to have the opportunity that we allow you to recruit. Because right now there are people getting the real estate license recruiting that don't even sell homes. And that's my beef with it. And and like what I was saying earlier with the pre-con stuff, I have lots of agents I really, really like that work for these companies. Like I got no issue with it. I've looked at these models myself. Like I've really tried to break them down and try to figure out like what what's going on here. Right. And I think for a for people with a following for people that are big on social, for agents that have that already with other agents, they can make a killing at these companies. For the rest, I think it's better to be at a brokerage that gives you a ton of training. But but I'm happy to be proven wrong long term. We'll see. Yeah, like I, you know, when you're at a lot of these, you're in a very rah rah kind of like motivational stuff, right? Mm. And when you look at kind of like just a breakdown of like people's income, you just look at like Stats Canada, like was it one percent of Canadians make two fifty k? But when you look in these like raw rocks type of places, you idolize the person who's making a ton of money. And what I realize is it's just the income gap is bigger and bigger at these places because you basically are making money off other people and they're recruiting. So in like network marketing places, you're supposed to like buy your own product or something. Like, and I looked into these brokerage models like. If you're only making money because like certain people are paying desk fees and you get a percentage of it, just sell a property, just do one transaction. It's so yeah. much easier if you're good at what you do, right? Like if you're good at what you do, you should be easily doing 30, 50 transactions a year. I'm so much simpler than both of you guys. Uh, I had one of those, uh, I'm not going to say which one, uh, but one of the ones that Tom mentioned called me directly. I don't know how they got my cell phone number, um, but well, you're a real like, estate agent, Steve. No, yeah, my, cell phone, my cell phone is on nothing, man. My cell phone is on nothing. You can book a call with me right now down below in the description, and I'll call you. Um, the And it's a private number? The, <laughs> so call you back. the bat line, yeah. The, um, uh, the thing for me was I said, okay, I appreciate that. I am an in-the-office-every-day brick-and-mortar. Do you have an office? No. Can I knock on the managing broker's door? No. I'm out. But you know, they have the virtual ones where you can like move around like a little dude and you can knock on virtual doors. Yeah, man, I can play Farmville anywhere. No, I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to like, that's not, I, I just, I value as an agent that's maybe it's because I'm on the borderline of millennial, but I am, I'm the guy that values having an office. There is team building that happens in the office that I don't think uh, a lot of people getting into the business now appreciate. And, um, when something goes really wrong in this business, it is so stressful and painful that I want to be able to walk down the hall and talk to my managing broker. And in the office I'm in, I can do that. And I don't think, um, I don't think it's an overall service for people to work in anybody. Like even in big brokerages, people work from home a lot. I'm not a big fan of working from home. The majority of the time I work for from home for convenience but in really day-to-day -day transactions to give the best service to my clients and to get the best headspace for me, office. Steve's deal breaker question is, can I hang my poster of my cat 
in a physical office? And if the answer where, is no, it, nope, I'm out. Where am I going to put the cat? Where am yeah, I where's the, the cat, cat going to go? These are the tough questions we ask. Um, <laughs> Zen, I, I want to wrap this up. We've, we've been keeping you way too long. Oh, uh, right, this, yeah. this, sorry, this no, was, I'm just enjoying like kind of shooting. This is our longest like, episode yet. This yeah, this was, this was a lot Wait, of fun. Be, be, can can yeah. I hijack your podcast? Just yeah, go for it. Go for it. So as you guys are sports people, right? I am. Steve's on the cusp. He likes UFC, if that's a sport. Yeah. (laughs) So you know how like in sports, there's like talking heads. They just talk about things. Mm -hmm. So we are the talking heads in real estate on YouTube right now. So my question for you is, what is a hot take you have in our industry? And I'm assuming everyone who's listened this long is probably in the industry that you have about our industry that most people don't actually know is true. That's like controversial. Yeah. Oh man. I mean, like, uh, I think you should get a fine if you list a property without a real professional photo. Like, I, I just can't <clears throat> imagine that's a thing. Um, but let me let me think, Steve. You answer. Let me think. I do have one that, if I shared it publicly, would probably get me in trouble with uh, governing bodies. So I'm not going to share that one. I will tell we'll you it off. Off air, um, ju- and I don't think it's bad. I just know that um, the public and, and the governing bodies have a different take on on it. I think if I said it publicly, I think everybody would agree with me. But anyway, um, I think it would get me in trouble. The one, the thing that I uh, I know I'll, the older demographic will agree with me, and the younger one won't. Is I've said it on here before. In the next five years, we are going to lose more sales skill out of the industry by agents retiring or dying than we have left in the industry. I don't think that the the younger generation, the people uh, under me, 40 and under, have enough sales skills and know how to handle people. There are a lot of guys that do things like we do online and they don't know, uh, they don't know what they don't know in how uh, a sale is generated and how you can actually create long-term advocates in your business. They just think about the deal, the deal, the deal. I don't even know if they know about construction. I don't know if they know about a lot of the things they know about. So I am worried that we're going to go into a spot where we have a bunch of people that are uneducated in the business as being the majority of people in the business. Actually, that's funny you say that. That's my hot take to where I see so many brokerages offering support staff that draft your offers. But if you're in a hot market, it's fine. But like, if you're actually drafting offers without seeing the house and calling certain things so that need to be fixed, you can't have support staff draft that. And I'm seeing so many things break apart in the offers right now when I'm reviewing these things. It's wild. Yeah, the amount of the, the, the people I have to coach through their job from being the listing agent to the buying agent like they come up with like, I just had a laundry list of inspection items. I'm like, okay, let's look at these. And I had to coach the guy like item by item by item. And I'm like, I know this is what you're bringing to me. And you think these are concerns, but you know, this is the reality of the situation. I, I get really sick of coaching people through the transaction of which, I mean, sure, I'm getting a sale out of it, but they should be representing their clients. So now I know that the message I'm giving them is going to their client. So their client should have hired me, but in BC, you can't have limited dual agency. So what are you yeah, do? I, I find myself having to do the other agent's job. Sometimes I'm like, you, you kind of forgot that you should probably do it. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll just, I thought about it now. What concerns me is that because I put out a lot of original content on these platforms, um, the amount of agents that will just take what I did and regurgitate it. I'm like, you don't even know what you just sit, said that you posted and and there's there's still a few right now, and, and I guarantee some will listen to this, that take my YouTube videos word for word and repost it. And it's wild to me because sometimes my grammar is not even right. And they're saying the same thing I said. This, like, is a, this is a hot take. I'm glad this is deep in. We're not talking about the beginning. But um, Tom has an issue. I don't have this issue because no one would repeat the crap that I say on my channel. But Tom has an issue where people literally take his videos, run them through Rev.com. Come yes, up I was going to say Rev, yeah. Yes. Run them through Rev.com, come up with the exact same script, and then re-read it back. And I think if you're doing that, you are looking for a shortcut, and you will not be successful. 
I just don't think you're building the skills. You need to be, you have to understand why you're telling the public yeah, what yeah. you're telling them. You, you, that has to be a thought that you can come up with on your own. I have no issue with like, listen, Zen, me, you, Steve, we all looked, we see what videos we're all doing. We get inspiration from each other. We take titles. You don't own a video title. You do it your own way. That yeah. I'm fine with. It's like, don't repeat what I said. Have your own thought. Because if, if the consumers, get, and some of these videos are getting decent views and I'm worried. I'm like, you don't even know why you just said that to them. Because it yeah, just it, it came out of my mouth and you redid it. The right? uh, Zen, the ums and ahs are in the same spot. Oh, come on. Are you yeah. serious? Yes. Oh, yes. my goodness. Yes. That's I love it. Wild. Like, you know, piggybacking off of what Tom said, the thing is, it's correct because what we say comes from experience. And yes. what I realized when I was younger, like in my 20s, I was like, oh, experience is overrated for boomers, right? But now that I'm at my age right now, I'm like, I see why experience is important because when we guide people through things, especially in real estate, it's not black and white. It's very gray. Like the legal could say one thing, but how you should act in the best efficient manner because you just want to get the deal done or it's just for the clients better, like to not go into litigation. You need experience to understand why you say these things. And when you just regurgitate it and that issue comes up, you won't have the context as to why that was said. So anyone who's hiring this person who's copying Tom, maybe you should really reconsider who you're hiring. Well, Fair they, enough. They don't know, but what are you going to do? Hey, uh, yeah. Zen, we, we always end these podcasts with final thoughts or words of wisdom. Is there anything on your mind right now you think uh, someone that is uh, just watching us because they love real estate or they're looking to buy or sell or the agent community? Um, final thoughts? No, not much. I mean, I would just say if you're an agent and you made it this far in our conversation, you can't be in this industry for money. Like there's going to be a lot of crap you have to deal with. You have to really either enjoy helping people or really love your craft. And when you get really good at it, it sounds all cheesy. The money will come to you. It really will. Because when you get so good at what you do, people will just talk about you because there really aren't that many good agents out there. Yep. I mean, repeat and referral is the whole thing. And if you just focus on on solving other people's problems, doing what you say you're going to do, which is so obvious, but like I come back to that a lot. You set proper expectations with sellers in this market, you'll be fine because you told them if you're just telling them what they want to hear, you're doing a, do a disservice to your own business and the person you're working with. Um, that's not saying be rude or say, no, you're wrong. It's this. It's but like lay it out in a way that 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 makes it clear to them. Right. Um, okay. That's awesome. Zen uh, other than YouTube or which I'm guessing we just type in prime properties TO for anyone listening or watching that they can find you and make sure to go subscribe to Zen's channel. Uh, the further he gets ahead of Steven subscribers, the happier I will be. Um, where else is there anywhere else they would go to connect with you? Or is that the main spot? Uh, the best way to reach me is just go to www.chatwithzen.com. If you want to book a call. Yeah, I leave blocks of my schedule open just to kind of chat. Amazing. Well, we're going to wrap up this episode. We want to thank, again, the sponsor for this episode, which is RRI. They're having their Master's Academy on November, November the 14th and 15th. Steve and myself will be there. Zen has been at the events before and, and enjoyed them a lot. It is live and in person. If you want to get in a room with other people like Zen, like Steve, like myself that take our businesses seriously and want to get better and want to move the needle forward and get inspired. And if you want that little like jolt, you're not going to get real steroids, but you're going to leave that place being like, Oh, I'm going to take over the world. Um, $200 off using the coupon, uh, not coupon code, but link in the description below. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. It's an event that I have circled on the calendar every single year. And in person, there's just something about in person that's different than virtual. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Steve, final thoughts? And not only do you get $200 off by using the link down below in the description, if you show up in person at the event center that day, you can take a picture with Tom's story. <laughs> And he will sign his signature on your forehead. <laughs> I will sign. I will sign your forehead with my signature on pick your picture of Tom's story. Nobody wants a picture of. In me. what order? <laughs> Dude, is the signature on the forehead and then the picture? Whichever. Or? I will sign Tom's story's forehead. He will take a picture with you. <laughs> so it's going to be a collage of Steve's signature on Tom's forehead. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Basically. And two hundred dollars off down below in the description okay. using <laughs> the link. Thank you, everybody, for watching uh, and listening. Uh, if you haven't already, please uh, like this channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube. And if you're listening on the audio platforms, make sure to leave a review. Have an amazing day, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Zach. Bye.